千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I would like to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware. As we all ready ourselves for this sacred process of the Tao, Tao Te Ching, Chapter Sixty. So, as you guys have seen, every chapter has a name in Chinese. Some have more than one name. This one has just the one that you see here. This Chapter Sixty is the Great Kingdom Chapter, Da Guo Zhang. So three characters that you see here.、Uh, all of these Chinese titles are three characters, and the last character, the one to the right, that that is always the character for chapter. So the name is only two characters. The first character, the one to the left, that means big, large, vast, grand, great. The middle character. That's the character for country, kingdom, state, nation, empire. So when you put the two together, it's the great country, the big country, or as I translate it here, great kingdom. Just to make it a little more consistent with the time of origin for the Tao Te Ching itself. So this is the great kingdom chapter. What is the great kingdom? Well. What it points to is what you build for yourself. I have spoken quite a few times before about how the king, or the ruler, or the emperor, is just a stand-in for you because you are the absolute ruler of your own life. So, for that ruler to build a great kingdom. That means for you to build a great life. That's right. The kingdom refers to life. To rule a kingdom is to manage your life. Therefore, great kingdom means a life of greatness and meaning. The great kingdom chapter is about building that life of greatness and meaning. So, with that in mind, let's take a look at what it says. Ruling a large country is like cooking a small fish. Using the Tao to manage the world, its demons have no power. Not only do its demons have no power, its gods do not harm people. Not only do its gods not harm people, the sages also do not harm people. They both do no harm to one another, so virtue merges and returns. So this is so concise, such brevity as to be confusing, and many people would find this particular chapter or verse rather puzzling.、And、that's okay. We're going to clarify everything. Let me also point out that the very first line of this chapter. Is one of the most well-known lines, often quoted by many different people, including heads of state. They quote this because of the meaning behind it is rich. Indeed, everything here, although initially difficult to understand, there's rich meaning embedded into each line that we're going to explore together. So more about that in a moment. For now, I want to take everyone through the sectional analysis like we usually do. 
So before we get to that, I want to challenge everybody to look at this line and then look for the repeating characters. You can probably see some repeating characters already just by looking at the Chinese characters to the left. If you do find some, please feel free to type it out in the feedback, in the questions area. And if you find it difficult or confusing to decipher Chinese characters, that's okay. I can highlight some repeating characters to get you going. So if you take a look at three and four, lines three and four, you're gonna notice that the entirety of line three is in line four. And this is reflected in the translation. Line three says its demons have no power. Line four repeats that entire thing with a character in front of it. And the same pattern holds in subsequent lines. So if you notice the entirety of line five is actually included in line six with the same character in front of it, which is a negation character. It means no or not. Furthermore, the last three characters of line five is reiterated in line six and line seven, as you can see. So we've got quite a few repeating characters here. And this stands revealed now as a similar structure to 59, where we've got two lines in the beginning as introduction, two lines at the end as conclusion, and then the main body in the middle. So now, by now, a familiar structure. This is what we have seen in the last couple of chapters. So we're gonna start now discussing the specific meaning of the lines, and in some cases, the characters. Let's start with line one. Like I said, this is the uh, one of the most well-known, most famous lines from the Tao Te Ching, often quoted by intellectuals, heads of states, etc. So let's begin with the very first character, zhi. So the pinyin is a little difficult uh, for a non-native speaker to master. It's zhi, whereas an English speaker looking at the pinyin will say z. That's okay. The meaning for this character is to manage, to administer to rule. So remember, just as the king rules the kingdom, you rule your life. That's the most important thing to remember there. Continuing on, let's take a look at the name of this chapter, which is the which is taken from the second and third characters here in line one. Da Guo literally big country and as i mentioned there is all kinds of synonyms for big there's large there is vast there is great grand etc and there are many synonyms for country state nation empire and so forth bottom line it's about a great life that you can build for yourself. So let's keep going. So continuing with the character by character analysis, uh, we don't do this with, with every single line. We do this for this one line because this first line is one of the most important. Let's take a look at the last character there. Xian. So the pinyin is gonna look a little confusing. So look at the sounds like, sounds like xian, 
What does this mean? Usually, in modern Mandarin, it means fresh. For instance, often used Mandarin expression in modern times, xinxian, where the first character is new and the second character is fresh. So together just means fresh. So you can use that to describe many things. Fruits and vegetables, certainly, but not only that. Everything that you can get in the produce section can be can be described in that way. Xinxian. It can also be used to describe things that are other than tangible objects, tangible things. You can have, for instance, a fresh idea, a fresh notion or concept. This term equally applies a fresh concept, xinxian, fresh idea, xinxian zui, etc. So this is typically what it means, but here it doesn't mean, it doesn't, what it does not mean, it doesn't say ruling a large country is like cooking a small fresh. That wouldn't make any sense. And it is also not saying that ruling a large country is like cooking a small fruits or small vegetable. In ancient times, this character meant fish. This was the original context that the Tao Te Ching was written. Now, Chinese characters are composed of radicals. And in this particular case, there is a left radical and a right radical. A radical is one half of a character. The radical to the left of this character, that's Yu, that's the character for fish. So in ancient times, it was actually synonymous. This character was synonymous with fish. And there's leftover meaning of that in modern Mandarin as well. So if I were to combine this character fresh with the character for ocean, hai, hai xian, it's actually seafood. So now you can see the connection linguistically of where that comes from. There are certainly people who look at this line and then who say that, well, don't you know, um, you know, this is talking about the ancient vegetarian practice, uh, but no, it's actually more about cooking the small fish. It's a metaphor that was extremely well known in ancient times. And 99% of all interpretation translation, even in the Chinese culture, uh, will point out that this was talking about cooking a small fish. So we're going to stick to that. So let's address cooking a small fish. Lao Zi doesn't say any more about that. He only says ruling a large country is like cooking a small fish. Now the meaning of ruling a large country is like building a great life for yourself is like cooking a small fish. He doesn't say exactly how or why it is like cooking a small fish. That is because the metaphor was already well known. He didn't need to elaborate on it. We're going to talk about exactly what he meant, step by step, layer by layer. At the very surface level of this, and this is, this is how I used to explain this line. I used to stick to just the surface level meaning. There are at least two or three levels below that that I never got to before. So I am very grateful to have this opportunity to delve deeper into this famous line from the Tao Te Ching. What is the surface level? What it says is that if you do not turn the fish over when cooking it, you won't be able to cook evenly. You want to kick, you want to be able to cook both sides of the small fish. And yet the small fish is not as sturdy as a big fish. If you keep turning it over and over again before you know it, it falls apart. 
So metaphorically, this is talking about how when you govern a large, complex nation, you want to definitely make changes, flipping things over. You want to reform. You want to make things better for the people, of course. That's flipping the fish over to cook it evenly on both sides. But if you keep doing that, if you make change after change after change with, uh, without giving people any time to make adjustments, and you know sometimes we see that incompetent rule, well, make a change and then reverse the change only to reverse yet again. That is a recipe for failure. So the metaphorical language is that when you flip over the fish too many times, it falls apart. So you want to turn over to cook evenly, but not too many times. You can then see this as advising moderation. This is the service level meaning that most people, even those who study the Tao Te Ching, they know this. They figure this part out. They haven't seen the other parts. They haven't seen the deeper layers. Now, you can extend beyond this point, and then you can say that, yeah, moderation applies to many other aspects of cooking a fish. You can say, for instance, timing is important. If you cook it for too short a time, it's undercooked. If you take too much time with it, you, you keep cooking it for a long time, it's overcooked. So just right, that's moderation too. And that applies to ruling a powerful kingdom or empire. You know, you can, you can be progressive, you can institute reforms. If you go too fast, people can't catch up. If you go too slow, you're lagging far behind what people want. So you have to approach cooking the fish carefully, just as you have to approach ruling a large country, a large empire with caution. So all of that is good. And you begin to see that there are deeper layers. I want to be very specific about this. I want to begin to outline all the ways that you can see the deeper layer of meaning. I have this table here to compare the two. Large country, small fish. So we've got five different areas of correspondence. This is just to get you started. Once you see how this goes, you can probably figure out all kinds of other ways that you can compare and contrast the two. So let's begin with the characteristic of a large country. So what Lao Tzu meant was that in ancient times, ancient China was a large, complex society. Could be quite volatile. It had to be approached with caution. If you do things too rashly, you cause problems. If you do nothing at all, you cause problems. So comparing that to a small fish is a good comparison because unlike a larger fish, a small fish can be relatively fragile. If you want to cook it, you have to exercise care. So we can see that just from flipping it over, you know, the surface level example. And that addresses the second one, change, make, making changes, especially changes in policies and regulations. When ruling a large country, you don't want to be stagnant, but you also want to be changing all the time. And this maps well to that surface level as well uh, that we talked about. You have to turn it over, but not too many times. Effort means control in this context. This is also about moderation. Too little control, you have anarchy in the country or empire. Too much control, you have tyranny. You have oppression. You want moderation. Not too much, not too little. Same with the cooking scenario. Once again, we're talking about moderation. 
what is the heat to be applied to cooking? Too little heat, it's going to be undercooked. Too much heat, it's going to be overcooked. It's going to be charred. It's going to be burnt. So what happens when you fail? What happens when you turn over and over again too many times and it falls apart? Well, metaphorically speaking, with a large country, it just means people feel uncertain. There's chaos everywhere in society. That maps to the example of the fish falling apart. Things get really messy. So still the surface level so far. But then what if you succeed? What if you are able to rule the great kingdom or building your great life with moderation? Success means powerful kingdom with peace and prosperity. People are happy. On the small fish metaphorical side, it just means the food is well cooked. Everybody can enjoy the meal together. So that's a positive outcome. That's what success looks like in the metaphor. Okay, now this, keep in mind, is the basic level of meaning for cooking the small fish. We're going to explore the higher level, the deeper layer of meaning as well. We're going to do that after taking a quick break. So let's talk about the deeper levels of meaning when it comes to this metaphor of cooking a small fish. To figure it out, we have to understand where Lao Tzu's head was at. He never intended to provide instructions on how to properly cook fish, small or otherwise. It is not intended to convey that Lao Tzu enjoys eating fish. That's got nothing to do with it. What he wanted to do was to use a metaphor that everybody could understand, something that was as basic as possible. When you see that, when you understand that, you can extend the metaphor to make it more general. What if you say, well, I don't like fish, so this example doesn't resonate with me, well, that's okay. If you extend it, make it more general, it would simply be about using cooking as a metaphor for life. So we, we ourselves in Western culture use it quite a bit. We say things like, if you can't, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, we're not literally talking about cooking. We're using that to talk about all kinds of stuff. Like if you can't take the pressure, then don't put yourself in that situation. That's really tense. May have nothing to do with cooking at all. Therefore, approach in understanding the deeper level is to extend and expand to understand the greater meaning, the greater perspective. So rather than just, you know, cooking a small fish, extend the beyond, it's just cooking food. And let's go beyond ruling the empire. What Lao Tzu wanted to say with ruling the empire or the country or nation was simply, was simply ruling your life, how to run your life, how to live your life properly. So then we can have the Tao of living, there is an art to the Tao of living. And when you have artistic flair for cooking, you've got fine cuisine, you've got gourmet chefs. This right here then is the extended version of the metaphorical language that we have seen already. And once again, we can outline five areas of correspondence to go from one to the other using the metaphor to increase our understanding from one subject to the next. So to start out, approach. Approach to fine cuisine. What do I mean by that? Well, what you get out of it, what you get at the end of your 
cooking effort, it depends on the effort that you put into it. It depends on whether or not you plan it out, you know, what the idea is, what are the ingredients available on hand, and the skill that you can apply. So your results depends on how you go about it. It can be something that's very sloppy. You know, I'm really hungry right now. I just want something that's edible. It can be quick and sloppy. Or it can be carefully thought out, carefully planned, and cooked with a lot of skill. It can be gourmet. So what about life? Okay, I think you can see exactly how we apply one to the other. What you get out of life depends on what you put into it. What is the effort? What are the tools and the ingredients and the skills that you bring to bear when it comes to living life? You can see a lot of correspondence between the two. Let's talk about preparation. How do we prepare to cook food? Well, it can be very helpful to talk to someone who has done it before. It can be helpful to consult with an experienced cook or follow a recipe. And the recipe can serve as a reference. You can get ideas from it. It can suggest ways that you can combine some of your ingredients. So these all go into the preparation of cooking. What about life? Well, there are many things that we want to do in life. How do we prepare for those? Well, it can be very helpful to have some kind of plan to maybe talk to someone who's done it before. When it comes to the art of living life, it can be very helpful to have the guidance of the ancient sages who had already figured it out. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Now you want to at least have a clear idea about what you're trying to accomplish in life as in cooking. So once again, a lot of correspondence between the two. What about the tools? Well, when it comes to cooking, you know you've got to have knives to cut up your ingredients, pans, pots, grills, spatula, the number of tools, possible tools just go on and on. And you want to be using the appropriate tools for the, for the meal that you have in mind, for what you want to prepare, what you want to cook. What about life? What about the tools that we employ, that we utilize in life? Well, it's the same. Same idea. You've got to use the right tools for the right jobs. Horses for courses. You have to apply correctly, and sometimes you don't get really good results only because you are not using the best possible tools that's available to you. So again, we can learn from one to the other. We can begin to see when the ancient sages talked about cooking a small fish, they had in mind a much broader scope. And they're hoping that we would do exactly what we're doing now, which is to extend beyond what they say and then talk about the overall principles involved. That's how we learn. So ingredients. Well, certainly good ingredients, fresh ingredients are essential for fine cuisine. They can serve as the basis for tasty and healthy meals. So ingredients can be just as important in the art of living, the Tao of living. Ingredients, we can see that as resources to gather for our plans or people that we work with. For instance, the people in a team or in a group, in a community, they are the ingredients that we have to work with when we need to work with other people for a particular objective. And here I've got some personalities clash, some work well together. Well, you know, in cooking, there are ingredients that just, for some reason, go really well together. 
the, the taste complement one another, you put them together, you create something that's special that's more than just some of their parts. It can be the same with the ingredients in life or the resources in life, which can be things, it can be people, can be monetary assets, it can be a whole bunch of different things. But some of them definitely have a complementary effect. Lastly, let's talk about seasoning in fine cuisine. You know that if it's too little, it can be bland, tasteless. You're not going to have a successful meal that way. If it's too much, it's too spicy, too salty, too sweet, too sour, too bitter. It's, in, it's inedible. So here I come right back to tie back to the moderation principle we were talking about at the earlier level. What about life? Moderation also? Sure. Variety is the spice of life. And you want just the right amount. We can take this in a whole bunch of different directions. I might, for instance, go with salt. Adding salt, you want just the right amount. Too little, there's not a whole lot of taste. Too much, you can't even swallow it. And you can apply that to life in terms of the hardship that we go through, the suffering that we go through. As an example, you can compare that to salt. How so? Well, think about how when we train ourselves to be better, to be more fit, to be stronger, faster, when we train ourselves, that training is not easy. It's not comfortable. It's not pleasant. It's hardship. We can be gasping for breath. We can be experiencing muscle fatigue, exertion failure, etc. It can be suffering. And yet, when the training pays off, it's like when they say, cry in the dojo, laugh on the battlefield, you can be having a good time with the expanded strength or capabilities that came as a result of the training. So just the right amount will be good. Too little, you're not strong enough. Too much, you overtrain and injure yourself. So there are so many different ways that we can apply from one column to the next. Now, this is really the greatest point of all, and that is the ancient sages never wanted to categorize or limit people into a particular example. They always wanted to use a metaphor that was basic and easy for everyone to understand. Cooking a small fish is just one example. It didn't mean that Lao Tzu was a fan of seafood. It just meant that he wanted to convey the importance of moderation, balance, equilibrium. All of those concepts can be easily conveyed with that one example. How do we know that this is what he meant? Well, it turns out all the other sages throughout history have used the same methods to explain Tao concepts. I'll just use another example to share with everyone. It's an example that I have spoken of before. I've written it into one of my books, and now it seems especially fitting to include that alongside cooking a small fish. So we know that Lao Tzu isn't teaching people how to cook, but how to live. And the other sage that followed this example using the same approach was Zhuang Zi. Zhuang Zi came after Lao Tzu, and he used that same idea, same notion. So one of the stories that he wrote, uh, I have translated. The title of the story is The Chef Cuts the Ox. And there again, just like the Lao Tzu example, Zhuang Zi was not trying to teach people how to cut the ox. He was, like the Lao Tzu, trying to teach people how to live. But we'll get to that 
in just a moment. For now, I would like to tell you the story about the chef cuts the ox, written by Zhuangzi. Once upon a time, in ancient China, there was a man who worked as the chef for a duke. And one day, the duke happened to see the chef cutting up an ox in preparation for dinner. So this was a very mundane task. There was nothing special about cutting up an ox to prepare for dinner. And yet, there was something special about this particular chef that caught the duke's attention. The duke noticed that this chef was very confident as, as he went about the task of cutting up the, the ox. His movements were gentle. He touched the ox lightly. He leaned against it. Even the placement of his feet seemed practiced, like he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly where to, where to go, where to put his feet. He moved in such a way that reminded the Duke of the choreographed movements of a dance. And he slashed his blade in and out of the ox. It was as if he was playing a musical instrument. And all along, everything was done as if it was to the rhythm of music. The Duke had never seen anything like it before. So he exclaimed, he said, excellent. He said the ancient Chinese version of Bravo. Then he asked the chef, how did you get to this skillful level? How are you doing this? Why is it that you are so advanced in doing this simple thing? So the chef responded to him. The chef said, your highness, what I follow is the Tao. It's not a skill per se. It's something that goes beyond a skill. And the chef said, when I first started doing this, I was just looking at the ox just like everybody else. I looked at this animal. After three years of doing this butchering, I mastered this entire process. And I don't see the ox as an ox to be butchered anymore. I don't look at it with my eyes because I'm so well practiced. After several years, I use my mind to perceive this ox. So I reach out to, with the practice motions for many years, I use that experience to direct my mind, direct my hands. Now, this answer was not what the deal was, was expecting. He was thinking that, well, you know, maybe the ship will say, well, you know, I've been practicing many years, so this is all, this is all, all news to me. The Duke was not expecting a discussion about the Tao. So he was definitely intrigued. He said, that's, that's interesting. Please go on, please continue. So the chef explained further, the chef said, you see, I follow the natural flow. When you practice the Tao, when you follow the Tao, you follow nature. I let my knife slice through, right through the structure of the ox. I go from gaps between its bones and I go from one to the next. The tendons and muscles come apart almost without any effort on my part. Your Highness, you see, an average cook goes through one knife a month because it gets blunt after he hacks, hacks away at the ox. A good cook that is more skillful can go through one knife a year because he knows where to cut. He's more skillful. This knife that I'm using right here, I've been using it for 19 years. It has butchered thousands of oxen, but the blade, look, as sharp as ever. 
So then the, the Duke was curious. The Duke said, well, you know, uh, it's great to be slicing through the parts that are easy, but what about the joints? You know, the bones come together in the animal in complex ways. How do you handle that? The chef says, well, your highness, the joints have openings. And if you look at how thin this blade is, the openings are large in comparison. So with the proper guidance, it can go right through those openings with room to spare. So that is the reason why my knife is still nice and sharp after 19 years. I do know that the joints can, quite, can be quite complex, exactly as you say. So every time I come across these complex joints, I am cautious. I focus my attention, I slow down my movements, I identify the places where I need to navigate through the complexity to make the cut. And precision matters, and sometimes it only takes one small exact cut to cause the whole thing to fall apart. And the ox may not even know that it's dead as it hits the ground. So the Duke was impressed. The Duke said, well, I look at your work and you definitely seem to enjoy doing this. And the chef said, yes, your highness, when I am done, I survey what I have done, knowing that it was a job well done. So I put away my knife, I feel a profound sense of satisfaction that I cannot easily express. So the Duke said, excellent. The Duke smiled. He said, the words that I have just heard right now from you, Mr. Chef, they go well beyond cutting up the ox. Today, I have learned a priceless principle about living life. The end. So that is a story from Zhuangzi about the chef cuts the ox and Throughout the entire story, from the beginning to the end, it's not really about cutting the ox. It's all using that action, cutting the ox, to describe something else, and that's living life. So let's go ahead and do a similar analysis of the story as we did with cooking a small fish. So this slide compares the chef and life, the chef's work and living your life. So on the one hand, I've got the story, the chef cuts the ox. On the other, I have the Tao of Zhuangzi, and Zhuangzi is the one that wants to teach everyone, like the other sages, he wants to use these simple examples to teach the art of living. So the chef says, that when, he, when the Duke saw the chef go about cutting the ox, the Duke noted that the chef was moving around as if following the rhythm of music, that it was the movements are so practiced and assured, it was almost like a dance, like pre-choreographed. So the chef definitely was doing his work with confidence, skill, and art. He was making that whole task like an artistic endeavor, a creative endeavor. What's that got to do with living your life? Well, here's what Zhuangzi would say. Here's what Zhuangzi intended to convey. If you can do art with butchering the ax, then what else can you not do with an artistic flair, with creativity? So the lesson here, and it's a, it's a very important lesson, is that no matter what it is that we have to do, any day of the week, you can infuse that work with your own creative flair, your own uniqueness. Absolutely everything that you do can be done that way. It can be done with effortless ease, practice assured confidence, and supreme satisfaction at the very end. But wait, before we get there, there is a lot more. The chef has spent years 
perfecting his art, perfecting his mastery. When he perfected those, he was able to look beyond the surface, doesn't really see the ox as an ox like he did at the very beginning. He's able to rely on his experience to guide his hands. In the same way, what Zhuangzi is trying to convey is that for all of us in life, remember the gradual accumulation of merit, of virtue, same idea, practice makes perfect. Practice a skill until it becomes second nature. That skill can be just living your life. And then the chef said, I followed the Tao, therefore I follow nature. And he moves his hands in accordance with the gaps that he sees that occur naturally. So he's able to slice through the gaps very easily without blunting his knife. This is a way to say that if you have the perception of the Tao, you look at what you have to do. And what you have to do is the ox, so to speak. It's quote unquote the ox that you have to cut apart. To identify the gaps in the structure of the ox is just another way to say that if you observe through the eyes of the Tao, you're going to be able to see the places where a little, a small amount of effort, precise application of force can result in the maximum outcome. That is, you can achieve the most with the least, get the most done with the least amount of effort, the least amount of work. It seems magical to other people who don't follow the Tao, but the more you practice at doing this, the better you get at it until it becomes almost intuitive. You can sense where to apply your effort, do your work in the right places, say the right words to the right people, nudge in the right direction to achieve the most effect. So that's the correspondence to following nature. There is a nature to everything, every task, every problem that we need to solve in life. To be able to see where you can slice through, that is a valuable skill. Okay, handle complexity. This is where the conversation turns to joints. So remember, the chef slows down for greater precision with complex joints. What that is saying is that we too encounter complex situations in life, complexity with many moving parts. You have to slow down. You have to be careful. You have to focus your attention in order to figure out what is the right places where to make the cut. What is the one thing that you can do to make the whole thing fall apart? Lastly, fulfillment. This is the lasting satisfaction that you feel when you do a great job. The chef felt great satisfaction to utilize the skills on behalf of the Duke in cooking the royal meal. That is just a way to say that when you do whatever it is that you have to do in life, a job, job well done gives you that well-deserved sense of accomplishment, of satisfaction. So you can see now we have looked at the story exactly the same way that we looked at cooking a small fish. We extracted the life lessons. So this is the method of the ancient sages. The more you are in tune with that, the more you can easily figure out what they try to say. When you are not in tune with this concept, with this correspondence between the metaphor and life, you find what they say to be extremely cryptic. With this understanding, everything is very easy. So now to kind of go back to the story a little bit, just to wrap it up, I want to point out Let's, uh, let me just go ahead and bring up the, the bullets here. This is uh, yet another basic example to explain, uh, to explain life concepts. 
this should not be mistaken as Zhuangzi teaching people how to butcher. It is not saying that Zhuangzi enjoy the taste of beef. No, that's that has nothing to do with it. Uh, so cooking a small fish, nothing to do with seafood. It's about life. Butchering the ox, nothing to do with beef. It's about life. So let's uh, let's break it down. What are the life concepts? One of them is the reiteration from the chef talking about how he kept his knife very sharp. So he talked about how less experienced chefs will be able to use a knife for like a month or a year. And then after that, you know, they have to, they go through that knife, they have to use another knife that's newer and sharper and so forth. So we know just by looking at that and then reflecting on our observations of life, our own lives and the lives of other people, we know that this is a great truth. We know that most people try to use the sort of the brute force approach to problems. People try to force their way through obstacles. That is just like the average cook hacking an ox. Most people using force to try to force their way through, they may eventually succeed, but at a great cost. The blades will be dull, blunted. The sharpness of the blade refers to your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. When that sharpness is blunted, it means your well-being suffers. Your ability to make more cuts handle more problems is going to go down. And this is why it's important to study the Tao, to maintain your sharpness so you can slice through with effortless ease. Then we also have intuition. This is where the chef talks about how he doesn't even see the ox anymore. This is uh, similar to, uh, you know, Western culture, a lot of times we use a meme like Luke, trust your feelings, use the force. Well, it's because in our culture, we tend to rely on the rational part of the brain a lot. Over-reliance on logic makes it so that we're ignoring a, a valuable and powerful tool that we have. If we can integrate our feelings, intuition with the rational parts, with logic, then we can become that much more powerful. So this especially requires that you practice. Most people, when they say they are listening to their feelings, are really listening to the words of fear rather than words of wisdom. You have to practice a lot to be able to distinguish between the two, then your intuition, your feelings become much more trustworthy. Then the story also talks about the importance of focusing attention. So as we have already brought up, joints represent complicated problems in life. And you know, as well as I do, that there are complicated situations where you, might want, you make one side happy in, in a content, contentious situation, the other side will be mad and vice versa. Then you're gonna say, well, I can't make everybody happy. I can make everybody equally unhappy. So you cannot solve a problem like that with a simple solution. And that is very similar to how the blade cannot separate a complex joint with a straight cut. With one clean cut, the joint comes apart. So it's not that easy. The only way to solve that complex problem is by focusing your attention to navigate through the complexity. You figure out exactly where you can apply yourself to do the most good with the least amount of effort. It's oftentimes a pivotal point and a skillful leverage of whatever you can bring to bear produces the greatest impact. It may be something small that you do, but the dilemma will fall apart like the ox. And then lastly, create 
art. So this is just to reiterate the, the importance of artistic flair, creative uniqueness. Even if you don't think yourself as an artist, I would still say that indeed you are. And living your life well can be your beautiful masterpiece. So this sense of fulfillment that you feel when you complete a great work of art is what we're talking about here, living a great life. It's beyond temporary transient happiness of acquiring something. And when you're done, you can put away your tools, like the chef putting away his knife with a feeling of supreme satisfaction. Everything works out exactly the way it should. All is right with the world. So as the Duke said, this is a priceless principle for living life. And lastly, I want to bring everybody back to this right here, being the correspondence to ruling a large country is like cooking a small fish. And I'll uh, repeat, I'll uh, come back to this again with practical examples to really make to really make it concrete, make it something that's easy to apply in life. So this story, The Chef Cuts the Axe, where does it come from? Well, you can find it in the book, The Tao of Happiness. This book is divided into multiple parts. You're gonna find this story in part three. It is the second story of part three. Now, we've only gone through the very first line of chapter 60, and you can see that the implications are numerous. What it says about life is profound and deep, and there are so many layers to it. I'm glad we had a chance to explore all the layers thoroughly. Looking at the clock, I see that we are approaching the top of the hour. So we have to jump to the summary now. You can tell there's plenty more to come. We will save that for next time. For now, let's go over the most important concept that we have seen so far today, and that is the famous first line, cooking a small fish. How do we apply that to life? This is something that we'll reiterate because it is so important. So the Chinese characters are to the right in red. Point number one about cooking a small fish is moderation, finding the balance, the perfect equilibrium. We have to do that with everything. So this is about how we have to turn the fish over, but you, you can't do that too many times. You have to apply just the right amount of heat, not too much, too little. You have to cook with the proper duration, not too long, not too short. So everything about cooking slash living, it's all about moderation. Number two, flipping the fish over and over again. Well, that metaphor serves multiple roles. One of them is when somebody is being very indecisive can make up his mind. As you are turning the decision over and over again in your mind, that is like flipping a small fish over and over again when you're cooking it. If you do that too much, the fish falls apart. If you turn over that decision too many times, you end up making a bad decision. The the idea, the decision, the strategy, the tactic that seemed to make so much sense before, they suddenly don't make any sense. It's fallen apart. You don't know what to do. So you do have to think about a decision when you come to a fork in the road. You have to turn that decision over in your mind, but not too many times. What you have to do based on what Lao Tzu is trying to convey is that you have to gather up the available evidence, make up your mind, and then stick to it to be decisive. 
Number three, yet another manifestation of flipping the fish over and over again is debates. So I talked about this many times before. When you understand the Tao, when you follow the Tao, you decline debates. It's a useless waste of time in most cases. Most of the time, debates do not end up with the purpose that people say they're trying to go after, which is to educate, to enlighten, to inform. No, usually debates turn into pissing contests, ego trips, to be quite frank. So decline debates. Nothing flips the fish and make it fall apart, like the back and forth in a debate, like the arguments in a debate. After a while, the truth, the facts, are no longer the centerpiece of the debate. It's all about winning and ego gratification. Number four, take action. So to, this is related to number two, be decisive. You want to uh, figure out what you're going to do. But if you keep thinking over and over again, overthinking is over analysis. Over analysis is what leads to paralysis. It stops you from taking effective action. So you want to look before you leap, but you want to go ahead and take that leap. So take action. The Tao is meant to be action oriented. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us all travel safely so we can meet again. Until next time, may the Dell fill you with peace and happiness.